Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Mary, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Mary. Aloha. Aloha. That means a lot of happy alcoholics. <laughs> you know, the language of the heart. And even though I'm Hawaiian and, you know, we always figure that we corner the market on, on love and caring because the Hawaiian people are really caring. You know, I didn't really begin to understand love until I received it. And I know that if I hadn't received it, I would never be able to give it not only to myself, but to my family and to those around me. What it was like, what happened, what it's like now. Well, first things first, let's clear the deck, okay? I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, I'm a pill head. I consider myself a high-bottom addict, a mediocre pill head, and a low-bottom drunk. (laughs) And I loved my booze, and I got into pills, in order to keep on shaking and then I could go crazy and get away with it you can act it out more when you're drunk you have to stop and puke on the side and it ruins the image you know what I mean Um, I used to go in the closet ever so often and pull my eyebrows when Harry was going to hit me it's a real good prevention because no alcoholic in his right mind would want to hit a woman who's pulling her eyebrows out in a closet, you know? So, I think that it worked. <laughs> I'm not a dumb dumb man. <laughs> but anyway, you know, when I, I come from a small island called Molokai. Sometimes people call it the island of the lepers. And there's a peninsula where people who had leprosy would be there. But it's also called the Friendly Isle. And the thing is that they have more bars there than they've got churches, and they got a lot of churches. <laughs> and the thing is, I was raised, I was shy when I was a little girl. Um, I was loving. I was real kind-hearted. And I believe that everybody was like that. My mother was a school teacher, my dad was a postmaster, and they were neat. Uh, they didn't hit. Both my parents didn't believe in hitting a child, so I was really lucky. Um, something happened is, um, when I was around six years old, this kid burned my horse's tail, so I set fire to him. Which is not too cool. <laughs> and <laughs> so they thought that maybe not they, not my parents, but the, the mother of the boy felt that I needed a keeper. And I ended up, I wanted to go to this place where they were singing Latin. I'm, I'm, you see, the kind of language that I heard was Hawaiian or English. And there was a priest that was right in the middle of town at Sun Sokis, and he'd sing in Latin. And it really kind of mesmerized me. And I wanted to go to learn where they would teach this language. By the way, I flunked Latin. So that ought to tell you. Just a little bit clear. So I went to the convent. My mother felt that it was good. And I learned how to hate in the convent. Now... They had hundreds of nuns in the two Catholic schools I went to. And all of them but two were beautiful women, loving, sacrificing, kind, talked about love and walked love. But they were two who should have been locked up for the criminally insane. And I was abused as a child by these two. I mean, to the point of making you bleed, you know, and uh, taking me a wet, you know, I had a, I wet my bed one night, I was born, and they made me go to the whole school with the sheets on my head, 
you know, I was in the third grade. Um, they made me kneel in front of the class and open my mouth and stick my tongue out at my classmates, hold my hands out and put great big dictionaries on me, on my hands. And if your hand went down, they hit you with a triangle, triangle ruler, and you bleed. Now, my mother is German, Hawaiian, and she ain't nobody to tangle with. She walked into that classroom while I was bleeding. And, you know, she damn near jailed the nun. But the thing is that something happened to me because all during that time, I was trying, I'd write to my parents and they'd tear up the letters. I tried to talk to my sister and she didn't believe me. You know, and what happened to me was I started to recognize that in order to survive, you have to do something up front and hide what you have inside. And I started to practice that, practice that on a regular basis where I, someone said about how they would try to be please or be the way other people expected them to be. I tried that until I started, something got ugly on the inside. I smiled on the outside but I was getting rotten on the inside. I'd always been taught, and I'm a convert to the Catholic religion, and I was taught that you love, you turn the other cheek, you be kind, and I was kind, and I got kicked in the ass a couple of times for that. And you know, I was a tomboy, and I started to smile and try to do that, but something happened was I started getting ugly on the inside because I continued to smile, and what it was is that I was getting dishonored. I was being nice and kind and forgiving and long-suffering and whatever the hell, and kind and all of these things, and I started to hate people just for the hell of hating them. And something changed in me. Now, I later found out after I got to AA that I could share something with another person. When I was a young girl, I got badly beaten, I drank, and I used to love to drink. I come from a drinking family, and it's no big deal. We always have luau's, we always have parties, and yet it's a way of life for the Hawaiians. By the way, I don't think that a Hawaiian is any different from any other kind of alcoholic. You know, if you get about nine different kind of nationalities, and they all puke. <laughs> you know, you can't tell from what, whether it's Hungarian puke, or Japanese puke, or you know what I mean, Howley puke, or black puke, or Hawaiian puke, you know, so the thing is that for me, I've always been really open-minded by any kind of nationality. I'm Hawaiian, English, German. That's another thing, too, is when I drank, I used to say, I'm Hawaiian, English, German, Tahitian, French. <laughs> See, because when I was 17, there was this one girl in, from Tahiti. And she could shake her ass and really get a lot of attention. <laughs> so and I was in a French convent, so you speak a little bit French and sing a little bit Tahitian song. And I think any woman can shake like any Tahitian woman. And the thing is, I just add a little shakes and a little, you know, singing, and I was Tahitian French. And I got the attention. It worked, you know. Unfortunately, it worked. <laughs> a lot of drinking back to that. But anyhow, getting back to my story, is that you start to become a phony, at least I did. I never recognized it as being that way, but I started learning how to hate. I wouldn't even talk to myself about it. I didn't really full bloom into hatred or into drinking until one night I wasn't as smart. And I got raped. I wanted to say I was raped. I was willing to give it to one guy, but I didn't like the other guy. <laughs> you know, that's the truth. <laughs> and the thing is that I was so badly beaten up that it took me about three weeks before I went home. And the thing is, about three weeks after that, I was demanding pie, apple pie, from my father, so I was pregnant. My mother was also a teacher, and she was in charge of girls who got into trouble. And I decided that I didn't want my parents to pay in the small community where we lived from, so I went to an abortionist. And the thing is that this abortionist had a gimmick. He would have the doll's feet, stick it in your blood, and shove it in your face. 
And he said, you want to see a baby speak? And I didn't see it. But what I'm saying is they had thousands of girls, local girls, that were going there for abortions. And I went a little bit off my noodle. It wasn't until I was in the Alcoholics Anonymous and I had a sponsor who was a nurse that told me that it was impossible. She grabbed me by the hand and hauled my ass upstairs up to the lab at Queen's Hospital and showed me what the embryo looks like. She showed me what a baby looks like. And, you know, she said, you might go crazy looking at this, but I think you better get in touch with what you saw and what you think you saw. She sat me down and she talked about the honesty of the program and how, you know, I had a lot of doctors and a lot of therapists telling me it was quite all right. And she, my sponsor asked me one thing. She said, Mary, when you were a young girl, did you think doing this was wrong or right? And I said, wrong. She said, then for you, it's wrong. And it was the first time that I was honest about something, not to be judgmental. There are a lot of people who may have happened to them. But where a person got sick and where I got crazy was trying to convince myself it was okay. She really explicit. She said, if you got pregnant and you were about nine months or eight months and a man came up and punched you in the stomach, would you get him for murder? And I said, yes, I would. You know, so I had to... I couldn't lie anymore to myself. And I was drinking to keep all these little secrets from coming up. It was like throwing crap into a, into a laundry basket and sitting down and trying to hold it down. I drank a lot and I became mean. And, you know, I, I drank and I loved to drink and I loved to sing and I loved to dance. But every once in a while there was a mean streak that would come out. I was drinking one night in, in Maui. That was before I met Harry. And it started out to be a repeat of what I just shared with you. And I picked up a tire iron, and all I knew was I went into a blackout. But when I came out of it, I was running out of the cane field, and I was covered with blood. And I didn't have a cut on me. Somewhere in that blackout, I stuffed it. And every once in a while, all the way up to even when I was in AA, they would have newspapers that would talk about bodies being found in the cane field. Now, that's, a, that's one of our slop dropping. Whenever anybody gets a little contract going, they always end up in the bloody cane field. And so I walked around always being afraid to look at the paper. It wasn't until I was in AA when I went to see him. my sponsor had me go and dump this in an AA meeting. And the AA people told me that I should go to a priest. And I went to the priest and he, dealt, he told me to go to my sponsor. <laughs> so I went to my sponsor again and she said, you got the wrong priest. <laughs> So what she did was, we had a priest that was coming down for an Al-Anon, an Al-Anon uh, roundup. So she made arrangements for me to talk to him, and he was talking to everybody in the world. They were over there confessing their sins. And I went in, and I talked to him. And he told me, Mary, how long did this happen? I said, oh, around 15 years ago. He said, Okay, did you kill anybody today? Tell me, who did you kill today? <laughs> okay, that's 15 years ago. The hell with that. Today, I was getting ready to go to the sheriff's office and tell them and make amends and try to look up the records of all the dead bodies they found in the bloody cane field. I mean, you know, this, we're going to be perfect, right? We're going to get sober. I was told when I first came to the program that it was going to take guts to get sober. I became a real bad pill hit, 150, 160 pills a day. I also was an epileptic. And an epileptic, usually they give you dilantin. Well, I got a lot of credit for being a real good worker in AA because I didn't want to take dilantin. And so what I do is I have seizures ever so often as a seizures. It's like, like dreaming, daydreaming. 
And <clears throat> when I get angry or when I get afraid, I do a lot of dating. When I get a resentment, I kill somebody in my head. Um, it's part of the illness. I didn't know it then, but I've had people who made it their business to learn about alcoholism and to learn about epilepsy and to learn about drug addiction and all these other things. And by the way, you know, I said this in a meeting last night. I believe that a person who's an alcoholic, the difference between an alcoholic and an addict is like someone who has syphilis throwing stones at someone who has gonorrhea. <laughs> It's not the problem, okay? It's a solution. In fact, if I define too much that I'm an addict, that's my athlete's heel. If I think that because I'm a Hawaiian, and I'm a Hawaiian alcoholic, <laughs> that's my athlete's heel. Somebody's going to rub me the wrong way about me being Hawaiian, and I'm going to get drunk. If I, make, if I make a reservation because I think I'm smarter than somebody else, and I walk around with that. Somebody press my button, they all get drunk. So nobody knows, at least I was told this by my sponsor, nobody knows if they have a reservation until after they have slipped. You know, and I don't want to take the chance. I walked into this program August 1st, 1965. The home that I had just gotten was gotten for me from an AA member who heard about myself, my husband Harry, and my six children, and we were living in a park. My kids were hustling for food. I was so bummed that, and that's another little thing is that, my husband had messed around, and the thing that pissed me off the most was he hadn't asked me for permission. <laughs> so, he had already flown the coop, and I wanted him back. And I found out about alcoholism being an illness. Now, I am not an alcoholic, right? I'm sitting there in the Hawaii Council of Alcoholism, and I have around 15 bottles of pills. And I'm sitting there and saying, you don't know what this man puts me through. <laughs> Just going at it, man. You know, I used to get up in the mornings from taking the dumb pill. And you know you know what the matter is from your eyes? The Hawaiians call it maka pia pia. Maka means eyes. And me, pia pia is the, is the leaking. It's like pus coming out of your eye. I take so damn many pills, I couldn't even open my eyes. I get them in the morning and I'd have one eye halfway open, the other one closed. Well, all you pill heads would understand what that is. <laughs> but I mean, it takes great effort to clean your eyes. And that's why I like booze. I made it. See? If you don't have all that shit to do, if you just drink it, you know what I mean? Even if you puke, it, it clears your stomach, and you're ready to go back and start all over again. You know, so I really love drinking. I really, I mean, I loved it. You know, sometimes I hear people talk about drinking, and I don't know how the hell they ever became alcoholics. You know, I hated the taste, I hated the smell, I hated the people, I hated this, I hated that, I hate everybody, and you know what? Fuck sobriety! <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, it, I sit down and I take what I like. They told me in the beginning, take what I like and leave what I don't like. And by the way, what gets me so, I might get you drunk. So if you like what you hear, fine. If you don't forget it, go to your sponsor. <laughs> I, Harry and I came to the program. My husband was a good time drinker. He's really good as a drunk. But I liked him the best because he could hold his liquor. And he sang. He's good looking. Well, I could say a few other things about him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm remembering with, with warmth. <laughs> Oh, wait, my whole age. Anyway. <laughs> the only thing was, he was a fantastic friend, and he was a good, he was a good drinking partner. And we, he joined the Marine Corps, 
And we we got married in Oceanside, and we were drunk when we got married. We found out that he was he had a different name, so I became Mrs. Canijo instead of Mrs. Lake. Canijo, by the way, means tooth. Of Mrs. Tooth, I was highly indignant. <laughs> anyway, the thing is that we drank. When I went up with, uh, my mother gave me about $1,800. This was back in 1952. And we shacked up for two months. Couldn't get a marriage certificate. I found out he was 17. And I was 19. I like robbing the cradle. <laughs> Anyway, that cradle was pretty good. <laughs> we got, we finally got married, and we started running away from the Marine Corps. I had the FBI looking for me. Jesus, we've had some real adventures. There was, <laughs> I remember when we were in Oceanside where uh, Harry was taking a shower, and our landlady found out that I told her that we, we got married the Hawaiian style. They had the bird of paradise that's going around at that time, and it shows how the Hawaiian women and the Hawaiian men don't get a Christian marriage, but they live in a common house. And so she said, did you get married the Hawaiian way in the common house? And I said, sure. You know, this is what we tell all the tourists, right? So the thing is, she was Baptist. She didn't like that shit. <laughs> so she called. She went and investigated and she found out that Harry was AWOL. And so she shows up with the FBI. And he's in the shower. And she decides, I play it cool. She decides to go to the bathroom. And she does a major job in there. Harry's very ass nude in the shower. The FBI guys don't want to go and look in the bathroom after she's finished, and she saved our lives. <laughs> you know what I mean? But we had all of these kind of things happen. You know, um, you laugh, you just get it on now. <laughs> anyway, it worked, you know. Um, I went back to, um, there's a long, lengthy detail about all of that, but I went back to, to Hawaii. And Harry had a hard time to get a job. And you know, there are a lot of guys that take a BCD. Harry was always drinking. He'd show up back for work. Well, you know, he wouldn't make it and whatnot. He went into Mare Island. And I stayed in Honolulu. And then I decided to go home with my mother because when I drink, I get friendly. And I thought that I, I'm going to end up not having a husband, but I won't watch out. So I went home and I stayed in Molokai, a friendly island. And um, Harry came back. And what we did was we had every reason in the world to drink. And we used every reason in the world to drink. Our marriage is pretty good. It was just kind of... Um, you know, you either loved or you hated. You didn't like. There was no such thing as liking a partner. I kind of like now when I hear people say how they're getting to know their partners and whatnot, you know. Well, we didn't. It was as soon as we got together, the heat was on, and that was it. We got, you know, we were together. And so we started to have children. And I have, I have six children. Now seven. I adopted one of my grandsons. Four of my children are connected with Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. I have a daughter who's a Coke user. She joined Al-Anon and got sober and clean in Al-Anon. I have two daughters who are in AA. They married men who are in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm very proud of them. I have a daughter here tonight that I picked up and through, I, I used to, they say that when you, when you, someone mistreats you when you're young, that you pick up the same habit. And those nuns used to pick me up by the hair and shake me and throw me against the wall. And when I became a mother, I picked up my daughter. She was the only one that I really hurt. And I picked her up by the hair and shook her and threw her against the wall. She's here tonight with my grandchildren. I'd like you know, love what you stand up, honey. And my grandchildren, come on, Marissa. 
These are my grandkids. Yeah. But you know something is, I, I learned a lot from my children. I remember after we came to Alcoholics Anonymous, we came to Alcoholics Anonymous, we didn't have a pot to pee in nor a window to throw it out of. An AA member helped us without us knowing to getting into low-income housing. And we moved in. We didn't have a lick of furniture. Harry had this habit that whenever he wanted a case of beer, he sold my piano, he sold my couch, and you'd be sitting on something, and the movers would come and pick up something. He just got through. He said, we got money tonight, honey. <laughs> it would be okay. Everything would be okay. And you know the funny thing about it was I didn't think this was wrong. We were happy. One of the things about uh, that I loved about being an alcoholic, and you can call it being an enabler if you want to, I loved drinking, and I loved being married to Harry Lake. I had six of his kids. I made the booze, but I love. it wasn't like, you know, you hear about the kids are hustling for food, but I didn't think about that. It didn't hurt me. And you know what? The kids were happy to do it. You know, sometimes you got to get sober, and as a sober person, look back on what you did, and then you start to feel the pain of what you really did back then. It took me getting sober for me to start to take a look at what an asshole I was back then. You know, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and my sponsor was an atheist, and I was so grateful. <laughs> I didn't, it wasn't that I didn't believe in a higher power of God, it's that I didn't want to hear it. I just didn't want to hear it. You know, I was going to be a nun before all this damn shit. I didn't really want to be a nun, I wanted to be a saint. <laughs> I think it's great to have people, you know, if you're a saint, you have a lot of people ask you for favors, and you go up to God, and you say, help that person. Yeah. Don't you think it's great? It's wonderful to be a saint. But then I thought that the best way to be a saint was to be a nun. My sponsor told me, you're damn lucky you ain't a nun. You drive all the nuns nuts. You know. But anyway, at that time, I really was devout. I really was sincere. So when what happened to me came down, it was even worse. It was like you're going to hell, so go in style. And I drank and drank and drank, and I drank anything. I, re I, I drank Shibu Dai one night. God, if you know, it's the dye, it's poisonous. But I was drinking so much, it didn't even bother me. <laughs> we came to AA and they told us that it was going to take guts for us to stay sober. And I'm the first Hawaiian woman in Alcoholics Anonymous to get sober. They're making a tape of this. I wanted the people back home to hear that clap. Because they're the ones who did it. Believe me. You know, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was so dingling. Because, see, when my husband was messing around, I wanted him back. Under no terms, I wanted him back. And I didn't blame him for coming because I was a very jealous woman. So another thing is as I progressively got drunk, I started to become more and more insecure. And Harry is a real mellow guy. You know? I'm the kind, he joined the police department, and, um, and his 38 was always missing. <laughs> so needless to tell you, when I got angry, my mother-in-law's house is full of bullet holes. <laughs> You know, and I used to go up, I used to get angry. I'm a, I've been shooting from the time I was a kid. We went hunting, we owned a ranch, and we go hunting. So I wasn't scared of guns, but I didn't get scared until one day I saw the damage that I can do with a gun. I, I got angry, and I went up to a, a remote area in Molkai, Laia Point, and for about, I hadn't been there for about seven years, and there were no homes there. And I had been drinking, and I was angry, and I went up there, and I, sh I went up there, and I couldn't see any houses, so I just shot up the whole damn place. And what happened was I was shooting into people's homes. One of the bullets was about seven inches above a child's crib. 
So, you know, these things are not funny things, you know, but I got away. You always, alcoholics, if you look at most alcoholics' lives, they got a lot of people that help them continue to go to hell. And that's what I did. I had a lot of friends helping. They kept us. I went to jail, and they couldn't lock me up. My, my uncle was the chief of police. You know, and I, his office at that time was three stories up. I screamed bloody murder so loud, I was such an embarrassment. He called down and said, for Christ's sake, cut her loose. You know, and then I invited that the, I wanted to invite the four ladies that they had locked up for their nightly affairs to be released with me, and they did. <laughs> so there were five of us that walked out of jail that night. And I was only 18. As young, I came to AA and they told me that it was going to take guts. After we came to the program, you know, there was something. I never met people like the alcoholics, anonymous people. At the meeting, they shared. And it made me feel ashamed. And it made me feel frightened. And the people that were talking, the subject for the first nine days, I was in AA, was a fourth and fifth step. And so I took my fourth, and Harry took his fourth and fifth step when we were nine days on the program. Now, it was wonderful that night. However, the next day, my husband ain't nobody you mess with. He was so, you could feel the hate in our house. It was like electricity. But in the nine days that we were in AA, he had formed a habit of going down to central office where they had meetings at Pier 12, and he went there. I, in the meantime, I forgot to tell you that I was suicidal. Prior to that, I had jumped in front of a bus. I took 150 Dexies. I drank Pino, which I'll never do again. <laughs> and iodine. You know, I played Russian roulette, but that was not suicidal. That was just dum dums. You know what I mean? You drink a lot and you have a bunch of hoods with you, and everybody, let's do this, and you do that. You know, being really stoned. But I mean, it wasn't trying to take my own life. But I'll tell you one thing, I never went up on the 28th story and jumped off because I would have died. Somebody said something about suicide. Steve did, I think. You know, I worked with suicide crisis for many years. And one of the things is a lot of times what we think people who are suicidal who are trying to get attention, they are. They are. They're being drawn to do something to themselves because they don't know how to handle where they're at. And it's their way of trying to call out and reach out for help if they do a dumb attempt at suicide. 58% of the alcoholics that we have in this nation are suicidal and have made attempts at committing suicide. When we took our inventory in the day after, I decided to commit suicide again. So I decided I'd, make, I'd write a note. I was going to hang myself. <laughs> so my daughters were going, Salvation Army used to come pick up the kids, and they felt, oh, these alcoholics, they don't give their kids any church or whatnot. So they pick up the children, and they take them down the beach, and they have little projects where they make books and stuff like that. And so my daughter used to, they used to bring back the little books and stuff that they made. And I picked up one of these books, and I wrote an aloha oi, that means goodbye, note to Harry. Then I thought, well, now I'll tell him. Well, kid, it was nice knowing you. You know, puppy coming up. And then it hit me. You know, you, you haven't learned what they're talking about being honest and not being phony. He's going to see your body hanging up there. It's self-explanatory. <laughs> it was the big deal, you know. <laughs> so I took the book and I threw it in a corner. And it fell between the the wall and the bed, and it opened up. I climbed the, I climbed the 
chair, high stool, and I got up there, got a tie, wrapped it around my throat, and something caught my eye, and I turned around, and I looked, and it was a splash of red, and it was that notebook, and it had a picture of the Lord in front of a door, and the door was red, and he had his hands out looking straight at me, and he said, whoever enters by me will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. I very, very carefully took off the knot before I fall down and hang myself. <laughs> I started my, my AA program that day. Harry, in the meantime, was pissed off and he wanted to kill me. So he went, he went down. See, because I had told him everything about me. He didn't mind that. He told me about himself, see. but what he heard, he didn't like. So he went down to the central office to tell them, you can take AA and shove it. And he got down there, and there was a guy who came in and out of the meetings. He had been around for 20 years. And he, there's always a reason, no matter how, how small the sobriety, that while they're here in AA, they help others. And this man asked Harry, do you believe that alcoholism is an illness and it's progressive and it's incurable? And he said, yes. He said, do you believe that Mary is an alcoholic? He said, yes. He said, can you forgive yourself for being an alcoholic? He said, yes. He said, why can't you allow the same courtesy to Mary? He was real quiet. He came home. He didn't talk to me. He still hated me. But we had a habit of going to the meetings. And so he, we got into the car. We went to the meetings. And when we got there, there was a man from Minneapolis. And he had cancer of the throat. And he said, my name. And Harry, they called on Harry right after. And he said, I cried because I heard of the man who cried because he had no shoes until he met a person who had no feet. And he felt ashamed. What we did was we decided to work the program one day at a time. And our inventory day was yesterday, the next day. Harry Lake never brought up my story to me again in the 20, the 20 years that we were, we were together on the program. Never. And you know, I did the same thing to him. He would tell his story, and he would tell his own story. And I would tell my story, you know. And you know, what got him sober would get me drunk. <laughs> You know, and what got me sober would get him drunk. So you can tell already that what happened was we were fighters. We were so afraid that if I made, I heard someone make a reference of God. When, before I came to this program, Harry was my God. I have broken the code of ethics, morals, or whatever, because I thought that's what Harry wanted. He never asked it. I just did it. And you know, when I had to get sober, I had to face the fact of what I did. Not what he did, but what I did. And the thing is, it wasn't even asked for. So when it came time to take our inventory, you know, it's, I don't think, I remember when I got angry soon after about something stupid about something that had happened the night before and we were talking and I was very sensitive and the next and I blasted and uh, and I, the next day I got up it was a brand new day and I felt sorry I felt sorry not for what I said because I had a right to say what I said but I was sorry for how I said it to him and I apologized to him I told him that I'm exactly that I'm sorry 
I, I have a right to feel angry about whatever I did, but it wasn't your fault, you know, and I'm sorry. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, Mary, that was yesterday. Now, I had been hearing about one day at a time. I was really being staunch about one day at a time. But the impact of one day at a time and living one day at a time came from somebody else forgiving me one day at a time and giving me a brand new day. I have watched alcoholics come into the program and they make ass of themselves sometimes. And, you know, I have to give them a brand new day. I have to allow them the courtesy of fucking up their lives and that's all right. As long as they're sober, they're winners. They may not believe the way I believe, but who the devil am I? You know, I believe that everyone here, I believe that I'm here by the grace of God. And I believe that you're here by the grace of God, whether you believe it or not. And if you and I are good enough for God, we are good enough for everybody out there, everybody over here, but especially I've got to understand that I'm good enough for me. The poison that killed me and was killing me when I first came into the program was I didn't know how to forgive. And when I came into the program, the Alcoholics in Alcoholics Anonymous taught me how. How to let go and how to let God. How to quit from being afraid. Someone talked about fear. F-E-A-R, faulty evidence appearing real, you know. And I'm not I'm trying, I used to think I could read Harry's mind. And Harry believed it too. <laughs> <laughs> he used to get drunk and come home and say, nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> you know, I've tried all kinds of things in order to get sober before I came to AA. And maybe that is part of the reason why when I came into AA, I bought it. It was like, like a person coming and facing a whole bunch of doors. And all of these doors had been nailed shut. There was only one door left, and it was AA. I had tried drugs, and it didn't work. I tried hypnosis, and it didn't work. I tried religion, and it didn't work. I tried fasting. You want to talk about fasting? I started religiously fasting. Then I thought, well, you know, the drama. Alcoholics are dramatic. And I wanted my husband back on the no terms, but I wanted him back. So I called him up and I told his girlfriend that I had cancer. I had cancer. So can I talk to my husband? She said, well, just a minute. So she comes back. She says, he doesn't want to talk to you. But, but when you die, can we have the kids? Well, you know, when I talked to my sponsor about all this crap, she decided I should go to Al-Anon as well as AA. You know, and I didn't like the Al-Anon program. You know what I mean? And um, this is the same program, but I didn't like the Al-Anon program. Okay, I believed I, believed I belonged with AA. But you know, the Al-Anon women helped me. I used to tell them, what? So, geez, you ought to get a gun and blow his balls out. You know, I just get so angry. You know what I mean? Oh, listen, I tell my husband, I'll cut you off with a spoon. You know? And, you know, that's real. You know, that's me. It might not be any of the other, but that's me. You know, I used to, at towards the end of my drinking, I thought, I've got to commit the perfect murder. <laughs> so I thought, this was before AA. And I thought, I know, I'll wait for him when he's taking a shower. 
And I was through the radio. I was through the top with it. <laughs> And it was just a thought, but I thought, Jesus, I'm getting crazy. And I'll tell you what the real thought that brought me to AA was. And that's why I say that there are a lot of people who are, you know, emotionally and mentally this, you know, that in the program, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. At the time that I hit my bottom, somewhere in my head, I thought, that this time, if I took my life, I ought to kill my children before I go. And the thoughts that told me, Mary, you're crazy. I didn't do anything to do it, but the impact of insanity hit me, and it dawned on me that the reason why I was drinking at the end was to make my insanity bearable. I was going stock raving mad. I couldn't handle a relationship. You know, I, I, I used to love to use a gun and take care of seven years of any woman fooling around with my husband. You know, travel. The news travels when you get violent. And I'd wait till a luau and somebody was messing around or trying to mess around with Harry and he was passed out. And in front of her whole family, you know, I take a thirty-eight and shove it down her throat. Like, make my day, you bitch. I'd love to blow you away. You know, this kind of hate, this kind of anger, and I didn't know how to get rid of it. You know, I was a mental case. You know, mentally ill. And I came to the program, and what he did was he loved me. And I didn't know how to receive love. And you taught me how. And you let me rant and rave. They didn't tell me to shut up. But they told me that if I wanted to stay sober, I had to be rigorously honest. That's it. I didn't have to be right. I didn't have to be wrong. But I had to be honest. And the honesty dealt with my drinking. Do I, Mary, want to stop this crap? Or do I have another excuse or another reason for why I should pick up the drink again? And it, they told me, you cover the pillbox, you bust the rig, and you cover the bottle. You put the cork in the bottle. It's one thing. Sometimes I hear meetings where someone says, a little pitsy witsy is all right. You know what I mean? A little pakalolo. You know what pakalolo is. <laughs> Hawaiians call it pakalolo. You know what paka means? Smoke. And lolo means crazy. <laughs> you know. So it means that if I want to say I'm sober, it means I count from the day I'm clean. <laughs> We also have a lot of people who talk about, they have so many. I had a guy come up to me and he said, Mary, i got to talk to you. So what he says, well, they're going to amputate my leg. I said, why did they have to amputate my leg? Well, they have to do it. I have bone cancer and whatnot. So, and my sponsor told me that I can't take an anesthesia. I said, you tell you, well, never mind what I told him. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, People who didn't even know how to find the goddamn toilet are suddenly therapists. <laughs> right? The night I went to my first meeting, I had a black eye. And I fell in the tub, that's what it was. But, you know, she said, you know, I want you to understand. These three women came with me. I want you to understand that. You know, this happened because your husband didn't hate you. Your husband hated his mother. And that's why. And I said, really? I thought he hated me. And, you know, my husband hadn't hit me. You know, I used to be the dangerous one. You know what I mean? I was the one that was kind of, you, you know, I was really sweet. Kiss, kiss your ass on a regular basis. And then all of a sudden... That's it. <laughs> you know, don't mess with me. You know, and I, I started going into what you call multiple personalities. Have you ever heard that one? The eye pinching was one of the personalities. 
But, you know, multiple personality was suddenly, I couldn't stand what I was doing rotten. So that was my bad self. I even had a name for her, Ezekiel. Okay? And then I had Mary. Isn't that so nice, Mary? <laughs> you know, I never called myself by my given name, Christian name, until the first night I came into AA. I'm known as Mummo. Tonight I met another Mummo who's a Hawaiian, and she's on this program. And I'm really grateful to meet her. You know, but the thing is that Harry liked the difference when I played the on again, off again. When I came to this program, the thing I liked the most about it was that I recognized that for the first time in my life, I found two-headed people. <laughs> See, I had, I always felt like I had two heads. And whenever I went up to talk to somebody about my being two-headed, the people didn't understand. And then I went to my first AA meeting, and I thought, these people aren't going to understand me either. They're too damn good. If they only knew what I did, they wouldn't let their kids come close to me. And they started to talk. And as they talked, they did this, and out popped the other head. <laughs> and I thought, my God, they understand. They know. They know what it's like to be doing something stupid and hate yourself for doing it, and you can't stop from doing it. You know what I mean? They know. And you know, if I hadn't had that kind of compassion and that kind of understanding and that kind of love, my sponsor listened to my, my inventory, and she helped me walk through it. And she told me, in order for you to heal... You have to forgive others. Well, I was ready to forgive anybody because that was the first time I really took a good look at myself. And I was really scummy. And she said, and in order for you to heal, you have to forgive yourself. So my message when I carry to AA meetings or to anybody is not so much about the message of hope, but the message of a conviction of being loved by a power greater than ourselves. I remember that I used to 12 step. They said that you got a 12 step. That if you're going to keep what you got, you got to give it away. I gave it away whether the drunk wanted it or not. <laughs> and that was brutal, too. If you changed your mind and you were with me, you had it, man. Not so much that I would hurt the alcoholic, but I'd be driving and I'm on my way to a meeting. And I got 15 minutes or 10 minutes to get there, and that's just what it's going to give me. You want to have a drink, I'll open the door, kick your ass out of the door, slam the door, and I'm on my way. You know, I had one lady who did the heebie-jeebies, you know, the split personality. She had her husband behind her. She's looking in the mirror, and she was screaming. And my kids were in the next bedroom, and they were getting scared. So I went in there and said, hey, cool it, man. And she kept on with the, uh, you know, doing the Satan and angel shit. <laughs> and you know what? I told her, you better shut up. My kids are getting up. One kid get up. That's it. Boom. Boom. Twelve step. Right there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sick alcoholic. You don't know which one is sick of me or not. <laughs> but I, we started to twelve step. And we found that whenever we made ourselves available for other alcoholics, it helped us. We didn't have a halfway house for women. And we had women dying in the drunk tank. We had a halfway house for men, and, the, and it was way to hell in Timbuktu, San Island. And that was the only place that they had for men sobering up, for the drunks. So what we did was we took them home. We'd pick them up and take them home. You know, we'd hide them. You know. There are a lot of drunks that we hid from the FBI. I called your governor. You know Governor Brown? I had a cat that was with me. And he did his inventory, and they had the whole bloody FBI I was looking for. Him. And some asshole told him that he had to come up here and make amends to the FBI. And the FBI was looking for him. So we stashed him in our house. 
and I had to get some kind of protection, so I called Governor Brown. And he was in the middle of that OPEC thing. And I said, I got two for you to handle. I got one guy in Folsom Prison that's withdrawing. He's got 20 of heroin, and the, is, he's in there four hours. He's going to be dead in another 12 hours. I said, you possibly can. I want him out. And the other one is, we got one here from the SPI. Both guys he helped. So far as I'm concerned, I love Governor Brown. He's a friend of alcoholic addicts. <laughs> Is it time? Okay. Well, anyway, we did a lot of things with the alcoholics for the alcoholics. And we found God in working with the alcoholics. I love alcoholics. And I have the kind of optimism that I believe that any alcoholic that I work with will get sober. I mean, if you're going to do something, you almost you should buy your own bullshit, right? And I believe that if I work with an alcoholic, I believe they'll get sober. My husband had the same feeling. We used to pick up drunks on a regular basis, bring them home. We've had over 3,500 alcoholics that have gone through our house, who have lived with us anywhere from three days to 11 months and gotten sober. In all, maybe we've had about 15 that died in another place. And it has nothing to do with Harry or Mary Lake. It has to do with the, the higher power healing. I always look at a real sick alcoholic, and I always see my higher power strung out inside of that drunk. My first higher power was the sky, because I, I had to get honest, and I didn't really believe I thought I didn't believe in a higher power, but I did. I just didn't think I was worthy of it. I hadn't learned how to forgive myself. The second higher power that I had was I heard a story that I'd heard years before when I was in church or whatnot. But it was talking about the temptation of being in the desert. And it was... He was, I don't even remember how the damn story goes, but he was offered money, he was offered bread, you know, he was offered possessions, and he had to say no. And it dawned on me that those are the temptations that I, the alcoholic, you know, are tempted with. Power, prestige, huh? financial, you know, being hooked. And so I called Christ. I'm a Christian proud of it. I call him the drunk that made it. And I would pray to Christ as a drunk who made it. You remember that time when he said, well, I'll drink with you, but now I stop until I'm in another world and then we'll have a drink then. Harry used to always say, Jesus, I can drink by the time I get back up there again. <laughs> But I thought about him as a drunk who could make it. And I asked that drunk who could make it, which is my higher power, to help me on a regular day basis. I've been helped a lot. My daughter had spinal meningitis. He helped me. I remember when I, I started heaving blood clots out. And on my way in the ambulance, I was thinking to myself, God, what did I do? I've been 12 stepping everybody. I've been trying to work the program. I've been trying to, I've been honest as a, a, I mean, how many enemies from being fucking honest? You know what I mean? What did you, what did I do that was wrong? I didn't get an answer. So they put me in the hospital and got me connected in ICU. And I was there three days. And on the third day, my aorta ruptured. And you have six minutes to seal it up before you did. It takes you six minutes. I was in a perfect place to be operated on, to have that happen. I was being monitored. I've had a lot of miracles happen to me. I'm funny. I don't believe nothing about the higher power until I see it. When Harry and I were, first came in, we were hungry. We needed money. We were told by the housing that we, that we were going to be evicted unless we had our rent. And our rent was only $54.50. 
you know, and on the day that they were going to evict us, I had seven envelopes from the insurance company, and you know, one was for twelve dollars and sixty-six cents, and two dollars and eleven cents, and whatnot. When you added it up, it came to fifty-four dollars and fifty cents. Not a penny more, not a penny less. I wanted to get a job. You know, and I was working, and I had moves. I gained weight again after I got sober. And my boss told me that I had to wear decent clothes, and we didn't have the money. So I asked Harry if I could use the food money, and he said no. And I got pissed. And then I had to surrender, right? He said, let go and let God, and I had to do that. The day I did that, my sponsor had, had been losing weight. He brought a whole bunch of dresses, beautiful stuff that I could use to go to work. That night I got a phone call. Mary, do you mind wearing a dead woman's shoes? I said, hell no, it's the living ones that I get scared about. <laughs> so I was given a whole, he said, because the only person I know that got as big feet as you, as you, you know, as Maggie had, is you. He brought, and they all fit, and they all matched the outfits that I had been given, you know. My kids and I struggled. We didn't have any. We, we Finally, we got a house. Okay, Harry got this, had wanted to get this house for us. And it was $200 a month, and he had $200 to put down. And he was work, working in Pan Am. He just got a job. And while he was working, one of these veterans, these guys coming back from Korea, had dropped his wallet. He had asked the credit union if he could have some money, and they told him, no way, because our credit was so bad. So he went and saw this wallet, and he picked it up, and he said, thank you, higher power. Well, there's $200 in there, and plus his pay, that would be enough. But this program, and the honesty about this program was already you being working. And so what he did was he went and he turned in there, and you know, he was pissed because he said, I turn it into the supervisor, and the son of a bitch will probably use the money. You know, they won't return it, and the address was there. But he did what he had to do. And I told him, you know, to try and fail is no shame, but they're not even to try. So he went back to the credit union, and it was as if they saw him for the first time, and they gave him the money, and we got our house. You know, and the thing is that in that house, we sobered up so many alcoholics. I could go on and on and on about this, but I'm running out of time. My husband died two years ago from leukemia. At the time that they discovered he had leukemia, they told me he had three weeks to live. And I went, he wanted to talk to me. I went and I told him how sorry I was, you know, that this had been handed to him. And he said, remember when we sat down and we did the inventory? And I mean, when we did, we had to do the third step after we did the inventory. And I said, yeah. He said, it was when I turned my life and my will over to the care of God. At that minute, honey, I was given leukemia for today. He said, and probably you will die of a heart attack or lung problem. And you know, I never looked at it that way. You know, turning my life and my will over to the care of God for me was a one-time decision. It doesn't say I made decisions, you know, to turn my life and my will. I can turn my life and my will a thousand times over. But when I make a decision to turn my life and my will over, it's a one-time trip. And it means whatever I get, it's okay. It taught me something. I laid in the hospital for a year and a half. They gave him three years to live, but he had inventories going, he had groups going. We did step study, and um, we found that a lot of people didn't understand the English language, including the English-speaking people. You know, so when we did the big book, we had to sit down and we had to talk about the words and what they mean. You know that. We had to learn and, and, and have small things that are in the books that nobody even, they just slide over them, but they don't know what a juggernaut is, and it's in the book. You know, and a juggernaut is how they used to move 
those big old idols before him. That they take a slave and throw the slave down in front of the, the statue, those big, huge pharaohs, pictures of pharaohs, and they would use the blood, to, the slipperiness of the blood to move the stone. That's the juggernaut. That's the alcohol. We feed ourselves, you know, until we move forward on our own flesh and blood. You know, that's why this program is a God-given program. And you know what? The higher power practices principles above personalities. He loves anybody. I don't give a damn if you molested your child, whether you raped your mother. I don't give a damn what the hell you did. Murder, whatever it is. That's yesterday. Somehow, we have to learn how to forgive ourselves. Somehow, we have to get the hell off of, I have to get the hell off of a throne. When I say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others, it means that I've got to forgive others. I hate to forgive others the way sometimes I forgive, you know. There are those who will bury us, there are those who will forgive and forget, but never forget that they forgave and forgot. <laughs> so all of these things, are, there's so many things I want to tell you, but you know, the higher power lifts, you know, it lifts us to be negative, I mean to be po positive. Negative thinking, feeling sorry. You know, it's another thing. The alcoholic should never, never, never feel sorry for themselves any more than a cobra would feel sorry for itself. Why? Because what we have done and what we've gone and what we've gone through would have killed 90 other people and we survived. <laughs> so self-pity is an excuse. You know, as soon as you go, oh, I, I, you know, it weakens us, right? You know, go to the sponsors, they come to me sometimes. You know, Mary, I don't know, like, that was that fucking sniveling. <laughs> you know? You know, I was taught by my sponsor, she was tough. She was not mean, but she told me the truth, and the truth hurt. And that's hard. But she told me, if you come in and you do this program hard with yourself in the beginning, it gets easier and easier as you get along. But if you come in and you want it all, the sponsor to do this, the sponsor to pick you up, the sponsor to tell you when to do your inventory, the sponsor to scold you like a mama, slap your little hands, then it's going to get harder and harder and harder and you are going to get drunk again. You know, you know, taking your inventory is another big thing, you know. Being thorough and fearless are the two words that people who take the inventory, if you're going to fucking take the inventory, take a fearless, thorough job. I compare it to somebody who takes a crap in their DVDs. And they take one lump out, but they don't want to take the second lump out. <laughs> So doing the inventory is the Hawaiian say, Holoi Kaleko, clean up. Clean up the mess. You know. You know, it's, it's nice being sober. It's nice being kind. You know, I'm grateful alcoholic, and I found out that when I say I'm grateful, it's because people have given me but when I first came to this program, I was grateful, but I wasn't happy. And I found out that the only way that I could be in a happy alcoholic was to serve others. I had to carry the message. I had to clean people. I had to bury them. Harry and I became the two people that used to bury the drunks that were in Honolulu. We found out that we had drunks standing in the in the mall for nine, ten months, some of them a year. And they had nobody to clean their bodies. So we go to the welfare 
and arrange the funerals. We get in touch with the AA groups, the military groups, and the military boys, you know, they didn't have anything to do but duty to this to this service, and they loved giving their clothes so that our alcoholics, drunks, that we don't know who they are, going through their possessions in the police department and writing letters to the families to let them know that their kids were dead or their father was dead. You know, and I feel those alcoholics are the guardian angels of the alcoholics who make it in the AA program. Those are the alcoholics that somehow when you're ready to to judge another alcoholic that they'll tell you, wait a minute, now easy does it. Do you remember what it really was like? And you kind of be a little bit more tender with the fellow alcoholic. So I've already washed my linen out in front of you. She's pulling on my dress. And that means shut up. And I'm going to do it because I'm nice now. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.